And from Capitol Hill, our next guest, Warren Davidson. Congressman Davidson from Ohio sits on the Financial Services Committee. He is also a member of the Freedom Caucus here with us to talk about a, a number of things going on in the U.S. House. Let's start with the, the biggest thing, I guess, is the $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan. It comes to the House floor likely today. You'll be voting on it by the end of the week. As it comes from the Senate with no Republican support, what's your, uh, what's your take on it? Well, look, um, we already voted in the House. Uh, no Republican supported it in the House either. Uh, frankly, two Democrats opposed it. The only thing bipartisan about this bill is the opposition to it. And, you know, it highlights, you know, that it really, look, uh, you know, uh, the White House press secretary called it the most progressive bill uh, in American history. So it really isn't a COVID relief bill. It's the most progressive bill in American history. Assuming, um, assuming that it passes in the, in the House and is signed by the president, what's the, the next step? How will House Republicans uh, try to move forward uh, you, your agenda, in particular the, the Freedom Caucus? What sort of efforts will you have to, uh, to respond to it? Well, look, unfortunately, you know, in, in Congress, you know, we, we you know, fight by voting in that sense. So we don't have the votes. I mean, we don't, that's the unfortunate part. We don't have the votes. So all we can do is call attention to the overstep and frankly, the, the fallacies that are out there, like, you know, only 9% of this is actually going to, uh, you know, direct COVID relief. So a huge percentage of it is, uh, you know, making it what makes it the most progressive bill in American history. And you call attention to things like, you know, 120% loan forgiveness for, um, you know, minority only um, uh, farmers and ranchers. And just if the American people support that, they should celebrate it. But the reality is the administration doesn't want to talk about some of those policies because they know they're not broadly popular with the public. The, uh, we, we asked Congressman Espaillat in the last segment about the $350 billion that's headed for states and localities and whether all states needed that or not. What's the situation in a state like Ohio? Well, it, you know, I had a bill uh, since uh, May, June of last year called the Flexibility for States and Localities Act. The biggest thing that states and localities need is flexibility out of the money that's already spent. So as you highlighted, there's a trillion, roughly 25% of the money that was already uh, spent in a bipartisan fashion by Congress. Uh, that is still sitting on the books unused. And part of the reason it's unused is it's very tight um, conditions on what the money can be used for. Originally, there was a tight deadline. It had to be used by December 31st. So they moved the deadline out, but they really haven't increased the flexibility. So far more than more money, they need flexibility out of the money they already have. Uh, and then there should be conditions on the money because, like Ohio, for example, we reformed our pension system. You know, only 4% of our budget goes to uh, pensions. But if you look at states like Illinois, they haven't reformed their pension system. Uh, their system's on a path to bankrupting it. Instead of reforming it, this takes money uh, from Ohio taxpayers effectively and bails out uh, Illinois' pensions. So it's punishment for states that have kept their economies function, have showed some discipline, and uh, it's a reward for states and uh, localities that have failed to do that. You serve on the House Financial Services Committee, and a week ago or so, your committee held a hearing into the, the, the GameStop issue, the, the rise, the rapid rise in GameStop game, uh, uh, stock, and the principals were involved in that Financial Services Committee hearing, including folks from Robin Hood and, and Reddit and elsewhere. What did you learn from that hearing? Well, as we started digging into the issue, uh, one of the things that really made it national attention was, you know, the dynamic of a Reddit thread uh, producing a, a long position, you know, pro GameStop, this company has a bright future, less invest in it, and Wall Street and the Wall Street pro pros basically saying this company's dead, uh, their company's going to be bankrupt, and so they were shorting the stock. So effectively, it became a short squeeze where the stock was going up and the Wall Street people were losing. And uh, the fact that a lot of the people who were long on the stock were trading on Robinhood was, you know, fitting of the story as the Wall Street uh, hedge fund billionaires are going to lose money to these small time investors. Uh, and so it kind of captivated the public's attention. When you dig down into what are the mechanics behind it, some of it is just free speech. Can you say on a Reddit thread things that you could say on a Bloomberg terminal? Or do you get special status if you use a Bloomberg terminal? Uh, you know, on Wall Street. And uh, what are the market dynamics that produce this? And so, you know, as Robin Hood's uh, CEO highlighted, settling in T plus two, the date of the trade, two days later, creates an inherent problem uh, that a lot of the market participants, uh, the traders, 
benefit from. And uh, investors and, and uh, actual companies that are trying to execute these trades would benefit uh, from getting to T0 so that you have clarity. You don't have essentially musical shares. I mean, there was a point in time where GameStop was 140% shorted, so you can't ever deliver 140% of the shares. So kind of, uh, you know, like musical chairs, when the music stops, somebody's left without a chair. Musical shares, if that closed, you know, there'd be people left without a share to lay a claim to. Uh, so there's a, a true market structure issue that needs to be addressed. Do you think that for most Americans, it was hard to tell a good guy and a bad guy in this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, I think initially a lot of the reaction was the, the good guys were the, the, the small-time investors and the bad guys are Wall Street. You know, that fits kind of the, the schadenfreude uh, dynamic that, that is inherent. But, you know, as you look into it, uh, there, you know, there was a, a piece where Robin Hood suspended trading. And they thought, oh, these are the bad guys. They're being manipulated to stop people from selling the stock. And you drill down and say, well, there was really a market structure issue. Uh, so uh, the question is, is are we going to respond to that uh, the right way? And unfortunately, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, and FINRA, the two main regulators for securities, are responding by shutting down speech. They basically suspended trading after this, subsequently, just uh, you know, Friday or two ago, on more stocks, about 15 more stocks. And essentially, you know, what's, who's going to be the next roaring kitty? You know, uh, Mr. Gill, who highlighted you know, the, the potential of GameStop and believed in it and uh, created the phrase diamond hands because he held it in the face of opposition and was rewarded mightily for it. Who's going to be the next person that does the same thing for a different stock that nobody's paying attention to? And because somebody pays attention to a stock that isn't currently getting a lot of coverage, analysts aren't covering it, and somebody on a Reddit thread or some other forum uh, says, you know, I believe in this company. It has a future. Uh, they basically are saying that's causing market manipulation and market volatility. And the reality is just this is the democratic access to capital that fintech is making possible. And so if fintech responds by suspending trading instead of responding by reforming the market so that we uh, deal with the structural issues, uh, we're, we're going to have more shut shutters. We're going to have more people locked out of investing. And we're not going to we're not going to get to the root issue. The root issue is we have to get uh, to T zero and ultimately to real time settlement, so that uh, no one can have multiple claims to the same share. Our guest is Warren Davidson, Congressman from Ohio. Welcome your comments, Democrats. It's two zero two seven four eight eight thousand. Republicans two zero two seven four eight eight thousand one. And for all of those two zero two seven four eight. 8,002. Congressman, just ahead of that hearing, you had a piece published in Real Clear Markets, and you write about the broader issue of where people can, um, can participate in the market, where they can put their money. You write in that, in that piece that uh, with the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates near zero, there's little incentive or reason for Americans to hold cash in traditional savings accounts. Over the course of the pandemic, the dollar has lost its value and buying power as the Fed devalues a currency. Even Wall Street pros have done everything possible to move cash out of other instruments. This has inflated asset prices, distorted markets, and poses related systemic risks to the markets. Do you think that um, the, the, in the aftermath of the, the GameStop frenzy that it's going to be harder for small-time investors through Robinhood or through other um, similar uh, platforms to be able to participate in the market? Well, I think it's going to be easier in the sense that, um, you know, that Robinhood, for example, raised a lot more capital. They got more users. FinTech is um, inspiring even more people to copy and launch uh, trading platforms. The question is, are our regulators going to arbitrarily cut off that participation like they did by suspending trading in stocks that had previously been, um, you know, ignored by the market? So if the regulators cap it and basically protect the deal flow for the existing <laughs> Uh, incumbents, um, you know, then, then that's the real issue. But I think, you know, it's incumbent upon people to really find those alternatives. And, and look, when you, when you print another $2 trillion, and I say print, uh, not because it's all going to go into paper money, but because, look, when we say let's spend $1.9 trillion, in this case, nobody's lending us the money, right? That money is destroying the value of the other dollars. Smart investors get that, and the reality is it's growing the wealth gap uh, because, you know, Wealthy people have more marketable securities, more disposable income, uh, and less of their cash tied up for current consumption. Uh, but to the extent people can, they have to keep up with this. That's why they're moving their investments to things that can see growth and asset appreciation. Uh, so there's going to be more and more demand as you see the destruction of the dollar through really bad fiscal and monetary policy. 
Uh, I hope the regulators can deal with the structural issues. Like I said, T0 is one of the biggest ones, uh, so that trades are settled on the day they're made. Um, the, those regulars, regulators obviously regulate based on the laws that you write in Congress. Do you think, particularly after the GameStop hearing, is there an appetite to address that issue in particular, but the broader related issues? Well, I hope so. We've already committed to have uh, follow-up hearings, and I, you know, I had a, a, a good uh, dialogue with, uh, you know, one of the companies that settles trades, uh, the um, DTCC, and they basically set uh, clearing for the shares. So once somebody buys shares on Robinhood, they don't truly own the shares. They have a claim to the shares. And then two days later, right now in the market structure, those are really settled. So there's time where all that stuff's netted out and worked through. Um, and, and they set market, um, you know, reserve requirements for uh, a company like Robinhood to be able to trade for the day. So uh, we're going to have hearings to talk about that. And I think my hope is that this will produce real legislation. So, you know, initially when you see somebody whose reaction like uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez have the same kind of reaction as Ted Cruz, you think, okay, this is encouraging because there could be a, a combination of a true bipartisan solution here. Since then, I'm not really sure. There's been a lot of lobbying to try to preserve the status quo. And historically, Congress preserves the status quo, which is uh, maybe a polite way of saying we don't get much done. All right, let's hear from callers. We'll go first to Lynn in Las Vegas, Nevada. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I had a proposal. Why don't each Congress uh, person do a COVID bill pertaining to their districts, find out how much uh, businesses have lost, whatever, and have per district a uh, money number on that and bring that COVID bill to a vote instead of all the crap that's in the bill now. And $1,400 really isn't going to do a lot for people who have been waiting a year. I appreciate the help, but if you haven't figured out a different way to take care or handle your business, you're going to a homeless shelter. So thanks, but... It's that $1,400, the congressperson before, he said, oh, people are going to appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate it. But what is it truly costing us? Thank you. You know, I really appreciate your suggestion, and a couple of my colleagues have talked about that. So when you break the math down, once this uh, $1.9 trillion passes, I mean, you spend roughly, uh, you know, a little over $6 trillion for COVID relief in the year. Of course, about $4 trillion of that was mostly bipartisan. The last two trillion totally partisan, um, but nevertheless, what do you get in the root issue? I mean, you'd be, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 billion dollars per congressional district. So my district has 730,000 people in it, and you think if 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 our office controlled 10 to 15 billion dollars of relief, uh, how much of a difference we could make? It's a great idea, and I think it's a, a it's worth studying in terms of how we appropriate money to do, look at ideas like that more. And even if when you communicate it to understand what is that per congressional district uh, and is it really is that much money really flowing in to my congressional district it sure doesn't feel like it are there oversight hearings happening on how the COVID money has been spent to date yeah there was a, a oversight commission uh, created a new panel uh, of course you know our our committee financial services has oversight of treasury broadly a small business has oversight of small business you know so on and so forth uh, committees oversee Health and Human Services, CDC, National Institutes of Health. Uh, but there was, uh, for the funding, a, a, uh, a separate o oversight panel. And then, of, of course, Congress has its own oversight committee. So there have been a lot of hearings about it. Um, but, but really, when you think about being able to be accountable, uh, each member of Congress stands for election every two years. The idea that each member of Congress controlled a certain pot of money to influence outcomes in their district is, uh, is an interesting idea. Mary's up next, an independent line, Salinas, California. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, Representative um, Davison, uh, my question is, um, have you ever uh, noticed the lines of uh, cars where people are um, in the lines um, for food, uh, for vaccines? Well, yeah, so I, I, we were at a food drive, uh, you know, in November with a, with a, with a a company that really started as a, an app challenge winner. So there's a congressional app challenge, and um, 
our, one of our app challenge winners a couple years ago turned their idea for a way to distribute food into a business or really a nonprofit. And this year with the COVID relief package, there was uh, you know, basically food boxes that were put in by the Department of Agriculture and it helped uh, distribute food uh, over and above the normal food stamps program, uh, supplemental nutrition, school nutrition, all that stuff. Over and above that, we had these boxes. And so they got involved and they distributed just with these high school student startup over a million pounds of food. Uh, and so we participated in that drive, uh, came out and handed out boxes to people. And then in other places, you've seen news coverage of it. Uh, but that's the one I was personally involved in, in that food drive. Uh, same, early on, you saw lines for testing because you put out these outdoor mobile testing stations. And, uh, and then, you know, I've seen people standing in line outside buildings, not necessarily in cars, but standing in line outside buildings to get, uh, to get their vaccines. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, distribution hasn't been perfect. And, uh, and really, tragically, uh, there's been an incredible need this year, not just for the public health, but the response to... Uh, frankly, political decisions to close massive parts of our economy that displaced uh, a lot of workers and and uh, caused a lot of caused a lot of collateral damage for individuals, families, businesses, and communities. This morning's Washington Journal, uh, Wall Street Journal, rather, has a front page picture of the east front of the Capitol and the gates there, the the fence and the razor wire on top. Review of security at Capitol finds gap in staffing and training. Uh, members of Congress, the House were briefed yesterday by the, um, the uh, uh, panel that's looking at security in the Capitol. Did you participate in that? If so, what did you hear? Yeah, so I went to a briefing last night. Uh, General Honore leads it. Uh, one of my uh, guys I served with in the 101st Airborne, he was a battalion commander when I was a, a captain. Uh, General Buchanan participated. And I thought he had, General Buchanan had a really good observation. Uh, that unity of command, the idea that you have to ultimately hold someone accountable, was one of the real failures. And, you know, to her credit, Speaker Pelosi fired the uh, sergeant at arms, the house sergeant at arms, and the uh, uh, police chief, uh, you know, the day after, or day of, um, January 6th. And, you know, there was a complete failure of leadership. What we witnessed was, you know, officers who were ready, willing to do the right thing. They just weren't really able because they didn't have the training. They didn't have the resources. They didn't have the command and control systems with their radios and even a plan uh, to do it. And when they assumed that they had a quick reaction force, that quick reaction force was far from quick. So, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of failures of leadership. And I'm encouraged that the Senate has replaced their sergeant at arms, not with an internal hire, but an external hire. And I think uh, one of the takeaways is that the House should do the same. Uh, and one of the key recommendations of the committee is the chief needs to be more empowered. Whether, in my opinion, you can do that with a, with a similar structure, but you have to basically make that structure so that they can basically hire or fire the police chief, but you create a stronger uh, chief for the Capitol Police. And again, um, not just at the top level, but initially, uh, or at least right now, if somebody wants to be part of uh, the Capitol Police, they can come in as an entry-level employee, no matter what their level of experience is in, say, the Ohio State Highway Patrol. So they don't come in laterally as a sergeant or a captain or a lieutenant, something else like that in the police force. And I think you need some of that cross-pollination uh, to, to kind of get back on the right track. There are a lot of other recommendations in there. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that the, this, this fence is torn down. This is the people's house, and it should be accessible. It does have to be secure, and in my view, we can do that just like we did after 9-11 without this big uh, Fort Pelosi fortress here. Let's hear from Rebecca in Malta, Ohio, Republican line. Go ahead. <clears throat> Yes, um, good morning. I, I'd like to ask a, a kind of a loaded question, I'm thinking. Um, I, I have a real problem. I've had this for a long time. I listen to the senators and the Republicans talk and speak to us as American people and tell us we're going to give you $1,400, and this is my problem. The money that you have is the money that the American people are working for. You're shoving crumbs off the table to us. You always make the same amount of money every every year, every month. You don't, It doesn't fluctuate because the of the poverty level, but for the American people, it fluctuates. And um, I just find it arrogant. And um, another thing, I'm trying to figure out why our Congress allows billions of dollars to be sent to other countries that have absolutely nothing to do with us. I don't want to pay for other countries. I'm sure probably 95% of the American people don't want to pay for other countries. And one more thing, it's all money oriented. I want to know why the uh, student loan interest rate was not brought down 
when all of the other interest rates were brought down to almost 0.01%. So what, why wasn't the uh, student loans brought down? Thank you. And I'm not trying to be unkind. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for your questions. And I mean, they're really valid concerns. Uh, you know, I think of uh, Will Rogers had a saying. He said, I'm thankful I'm not getting all the government I'm paying for. Of course, he, he was, uh, you know, a star and probably paid a lot of taxes and wasn't looking for a really big government. I think a lot of Republicans uh, are, are rooting for smaller government, but right, right now the American people are getting far more government than they are paying for. The federal government spends far more money uh, than, than they bring in, and the revenues are going up. So despite the narratives, oh, well, you know, uh, there's a tax cut and it cut revenues. No, revenue was still growing over 3%. The spending's gone up even more, and the problem is, is people look to the government to be the giver of things uh, and that's a pivot in history, right? I mean, the government uh, should be the protector of our system, uh, that should be the protector of freedoms that exist by, because we're endowed by our creator with these freedoms. Uh, and instead, the government's kind of morphed to the giver of everything. And a government big enough to give everything is a government big enough to take away everything. And we're seeing a lot of that now. And when it's not the government that's doing it, they're enabling kind of allies to do the same thing. So I think we, we have to get a smaller a more accountable government and uh, you know we're a long ways away from that with the current level of spending um, and so when you look at uh, you know one of your other concerns there is foreign aid you know there's like 12 billion dollars in this COVID relief package so how is 12 billion dollars of American money uh, gonna help America's COVID problem the foreign aid issue uh, in some cases could be helpful to provide peace but I, I appreciate one of the uh, uh, comments I received was, you know, why are we going to give, uh, you know, money for gender studies in Pakistan when people in Flint, Michigan still don't have clean drinking water and Ohio still doesn't have a bridge over the Ohio River between Cincinnati and Kentucky. Uh, so those are really valid concerns and, and uh, you know, I, I hope we can address them. Our Thanks. caller was there from Ohio, obviously. Let me ask you about the political dynamics in your state um, with the headline from your appearance on Fox a couple of weeks ago, Ohio Representative Davidson, considering a run for Senate or governor, urges the Republican Party to pick a side on internal divide. This would be for the seat for Rob Portman, correct? Well, as an example, I wasn't considering uh, Senator Portman. I, you know, when I first ran for Congress, I mean, I wasn't even planning to run for Congress. I was a business guy at the time. And Speaker Boehner surprisingly resigned. And, you know, someone stopped in my office and suggested It'd be great if there was an Army Ranger business guy in the race. And we laughed because it was crazy. And I went home and told my wife about it. And she said, well, what would you tell him? I said, well, we laughed because it was crazy. And she said, no, it's not. You'd be great at that. So we talked over how crazy it was. And she goes, yeah, but this is for our country. And ultimately, I decided to do it. But since then, one of the questions you always get is, well, what are you going to run for next? Because so many people go into politics to go on to the next thing. And, uh, and so it's, it's flattering and humbling to have my name come up and other things. I'm pretty energized by what we're working on in terms of taking back the majority in the House. But frankly, when Sherrod Brown won uh, the Senate race in 2018, I said, well, if I'm still doing this, I'll take a look because I don't think he's a very good uh, senator in terms of representing the views and values of Ohio voters. Um, I wasn't expecting Senator Portman to resign, so I haven't really taken a hard look at Senate for 2022. But I have taken a look at the governor's race. I, I'm, I'm flattered by people that suggest I would be a good governor and a good alternative to Governor DeWine. Do you think that the governor's correct in continuing some of the restrictions, the COVID restrictions in that state? I don't think he was correct in imposing most of them. And the, the real question is, is, how is it still an emergency almost a year later? I mean, I did an interview uh, that highlighted the fact he's never communicated uh, an, an objective strategy, strategy, an exit strategy for this. And on that day, he communicated an objective strategy almost a year ago, uh, a, almost a year later from when the first question was asked. So, you know, the real problem isn't just what the strategy's been. It's the fact that he's completely ignored the legislature, as have many governors around the country. And look, we have a republic if we can keep it. We can't keep it by just empowering one single person per state uh, with this kind of power. They should be accountable to a legislature, and the legislatures are accountable to the people. And if the people of a state decide that and they pass a law, that's one thing. But to be basically ruled by governors uh, by edict uh, is a real problem. Let's hear from David in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, on the Republican line. Hi, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go yes. ahead. Uh, thank you. Just, uh, I have three quick points. Well, the first two are quick. What is your impression of 
the fact we're spending 10 to 1 on states and localities versus small businesses. I thought the major problem with the uh, reaction to the uh, COVID pandemic was the closing of businesses, and that is that was the biggest hit that we took. But instead of giving 10 to 1 in states over small businesses, it kind of says something about priorities. And the second point, uh, could you discuss the special benefit to federal workers who are allowed to be paid to stay home if any of their children are in school less than five days a week, like uh, hybrid schools, for instance, only to federal workers? And the last one's a bit off topic, but I haven't been able to get through. It's about unity. I would suggest that we end all language that arbitrarily slots people into races, communities, and people. I think putting people in the slots is inherently divisive. Um, so I would say end all racial language. Like Pelosi was on the right track when she said to end any reference to gender, but you can't do that. It's uh, gender is pretty strong. It's natural, but. All right, all right, David, you've got a couple of points there. Congressman Davidson. Yeah, I think uh, we'll just deal with the, the uh, divisive uh, factors. You know, everything that has, uh, you know, for example, you know, recently Coke had training for some of their employees to encourage them to be less white. Uh, or, you know, imagine if somebody encouraged somebody to be less black or less Hispanic or whatever. And I think the emphasis should be the other way. Be more American. Our country really is a diverse country. We're unique in the world. Uh, you know, look at the way that so many people, not just in the past, but every year, even today, surging towards our border because they view this as the land of opportunity. Uh, this place is so special, we should cherish it. And one of our mottos is e pluribus unum, out of many one, and we spend far too little uh, energy emphasizing that this is, uh, you know, so special because of that. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, there are frankly critical theory Marxists that want to tear that down. Uh, even if they don't realize that's exactly the ideology they're embracing. Every way to tear it down, destroy it, and divide us. Uh, and, and mostly that's for their own power. So that's disappointing. So let's talk about what you talked about about businesses. I mean, frankly, a lot of the money that went to businesses during the year uh, didn't even go directly to businesses. The payroll protection plan, for example, people think of that as something that went to businesses. It was targeted for companies with under 500 employees. Um, and we spent, you know, about $700 billion, if I recall correctly on that. Um, this is a package that comes in for uh, after all that. There's still some more uh, payroll protection plan money in it in another round. But what did that mean? And my district has about 730,000 people in it. We had over 100,000 people stay on payroll. And what did that mean? They kept getting paid where they're normally getting paid. For the most part, that meant they kept getting benefits where they're normally getting benefits, and it meant that that business was, if they, even if they were closed, they were in better position to open up and recover. Uh, so if they weren't arbitrarily being forced to close or forced to limit their occupancy to 25 or 30 percent or whatever, they could grow faster. And when you look at the public's reaction, the public's reaction, at least in my district, is they're ready to go back. In the schools, most of our schools went back on time in the fall. And those that were closed have since opened. Uh, I, you know, there are very few schools that are still closed for in-person learning <clears throat> in Ohio's 8th District. And so, uh, you know, that program worked well, and it kept people in their jobs. 80% of those funds went to uh, businesses that took 150000 or less. So those aren't big loans to big companies. Those are to smaller employers. We had about 9,000 of those kind of loans in our district. So it really made a difference. Uh, what will happen with this money to states and localities? I covered that on a different call. It's really going to bail out cities and states and localities that have been irresponsible broadly. The flexibility is the biggest thing uh, that these places need. And that's been not just in my district or my state. That's talking to colleagues uh, across the aisle and across the country. I'd say the last thing is federal benefits that say, hey, we're going to have a special program if you've got kids that stay at home. Uh, the federal government is an employer. Uh, you offer benefits packages in, in uh, most places. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a benefits package that the federal government should be offering. Very few Americans have that in their workplace, but many do. Uh, and I think that highlights the nature of this pandemic, not just the health risk, but the government imposed mandates that have artificially closed our economy and caused far too much collateral damage. Yes, it's tragic we've lost so many lives, but it's been entirely uh, avoidable to lose this much freedom in our country. So when we pay out these benefits, 
uh, that many, many white collar workers are getting, the blue collar workers in our country or the service workers that couldn't go back to work, they're being dis disproportionately affected. And the right answer to that isn't more transfer payments, more wealth redistribution. The right answer is more economic opportunity, more openness, safely. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I think it's out of step to be doing these things for federal employees that are so inaccessible for most workers in America. Congressman Warren Davidson, beginning his fourth term re representing the state of Ohio. Congressman Davidson, thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you. More ahead here on Washington Journal, we are joined next by Amy Walter, who is, the, who is with us up next.